All right, so this week's Bible question is, does the God of the Bible have eyes and ears, or how do we understand biblical metaphor? Last week, as we were talking about do we interpret the Bible literally, we talked about metaphors a bit. Words, images drawn from everyday life that describe less familiar elements. So this lesson continues the discussion with particular attention to metaphors for God. Words from almost every sphere of life are used to speak of God. Because God is so vastly different from us. We don't have uh, a direct experiential revelation of God that we can say, hey, this is exactly what God looks like. We haven't seen God like that. So we take all the things from our lives and try to use those things that we have experienced and sensed uh, and use them to explain God who is so much bigger than what we can sense, taste, touch, feel, sight. So all these different areas of life have been used to describe God. So we have the world of nature. God is depicted as fire, the morning dew, an eagle, even maggots. Social and political life. God is described as a king, a judge, a friend. God is Abraham's friend. Jesus' disciples are his friends. All of this is in scripture. Family. God is portrayed as a husband, as a father, as a mother. For example, in Isaiah 66, 3, God comforts the people like a mother. In Isaiah 42, 14, the suffering of God is likened to a woman's pain in childbirth. Then you have human vocation, jobs. God's a shepherd, a teacher, a seamstress, a midwife, a physician, a potter, a metal worker, a guard, a warrior, a farmer, even a thief. Uh, so you see in Psalm, you know, the idea of God knitting together uh, in a womb. In Isaiah, God's a midwife who delivers children. God's a teacher in Isaiah 30. We also use objects people have made. God is a fortress, a shield, a horn, a lamp, a fountain, a dwelling. In Psalm 119, God is my hiding place and my shield. God is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. In these cases, an object which has no life is used to speak of a living and active God in relationship. At the same time, this language is not impersonal, for the objects are understood as an extension of the person who made them. Then you have the human body, mind, emotions with associated activities. Images of God from this category are really common. God speaks, acts, makes, thinks, plans, grieves, is angry, rejoices, changes God's mind, is jealous, even whistles. These words speak of God as if God had a human body, mind, and emotions. So the Bible also speaks of God's ears, eyes, nostrils, arms, bosom, mouth, soul, mind, fingers, gray hair, even intestines. In Isaiah, the NRSV translated heart, but it's literally intestines. The word scholars use for this kind of language for God is anthropomorphism, giving human characteristics to that which is not human. In this case, God. We remember, God is not Human God is a different ontological category, a whole other category of being that is completely not us. God is not human, but we have a hard time explaining what God is. Uh, so often we use all these different metaphors to try to point to that reality. We've talked about it before with maps. A lot of different two-dimensional maps you will hold, and if you hold them all together, you'll get a sense of what a three-dimensional world is like. If you only use one map, you're going to have a distorted view of the world. You're going to think Greenland's bigger than Africa. It's not. Same thing with these metaphors. If you only highlight one metaphor, like God as Father, you're going to have a distorted view of God. If you only see God as Shepherd, you're going to have a distorted view of God. All of these held kind of in tension with each other give us an idea. So God as Mother, God as Father... God as husband, God as farmer, God as shepherd, God as fire. All of these things together point us uh, to what God is. We have to be careful not to lean too hard into one and not to go overboard with one too. Each metaphor has its limits. We'll talk about more on that in a moment. So in Genesis 1, 26, 27 states that male and female are created in the image and likeness of God... It means we are like God in some respects and not like God in others. Isaiah 31 3 denies that God has a body of flesh. Hosea 11 9 states that God is not a human being. So we aren't actually think of God as one who actually has arms, fingers, and gray hair. But we do anyway. 
When you ask kids to draw a god, they draw a person most of the time. Usually an old dude with gray hair. Now part of that's because the church and we emphasize God as an old white guy. Uh, that's how our language and our images come up all the time in our stained glass windows. Uh, we may not realize it, but we subconsciously put that image into kids. And that's what they end up drawing. But they could easily draw any kind of thing. Uh, a weird ball of energy, uh, for that matter. What is God? We can only really explain what God is but by saying what God is like and what God is not. It's called an apophatic theology. Sometimes the best way to get at what something is is by naming all the things it's not and kind of putting a fence around uh, what it is because you can't fully describe what it is. But we do talk about God with this anthropomorphic language. So how should we understand it? We might call it anthropomorphic metaphor, interpreted in much the same way as other metaphors. These words do reveal something about God, so they, they do have a literal element in how God relates to the world. They're not to be dismissed as naive thinking nor as non-literal language in any respect, but as with all metaphors, we must seek to determine where the point of comparison lies and not go too far. How does language speak of the way human beings are like and unlike God? Most basically, giving human characteristics reveals a God who is living and personal, who communicates with and interacts with us. And it helps us kind of, if we only picture God as a big ball of energy, we don't have relationships with big balls of energy. But we do have relationships with people, with mothers and with fathers and with friends. So it's easier for us to picture God like us because we have relationships with things like us. Does that make sense? But you have to be careful not to go too far into it because you can tilt the scales too much of God as Father, too much of God as human. A philosopher named Ludwig von Feuerbach made the argument that God isn't real. All it is is we take what we like about humanity and just make it exponentially bigger and say, boom, that's God. And there are all kinds of interesting historical things that come from that. Uh, Karl Marx, Hitler all kind of read Feuerbach and used some of those ideas in their later thinking. But sometimes we do that. We don't even realize it, but we just kind of make God the better human. And that's where the danger of the metaphors lies. We have to sometimes pick the other metaphors too, the all-consuming fire, uh, the pillar of night, uh, pillar of cloud by day, these other natural things too. If you've read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, you know, a lot of people talk about how the line that which in the wardrobe is an allegory for the Bible. It's not. Uh, we want to make things have these one-on-one -on -one comparisons, but that's where you get into danger with metaphors and things. What Lewis did was kind of say, knowing what I know about God, if a world like Narnia existed, how might the God I know interact with that world? So it's based on knowledge of God and how God acts in this world to imagine how God might act and do and provide salvation in a world like Narnia. But it's not meant to be Aslan equals Jesus in these things. Then you get too close. Allegories end up becoming trying to get too close to things. If they're not a true allegory, it distorts it. Same thing with metaphor. If we take it too seriously and we miss where the point of commonality is and we go past that, we end up distorting the truth. So with all things, metaphor is a kind of slippery slope. Churches lived on the slippery slope. If you don't like slippery slopes, I have bad news for you. Uh, that's why I always hate the logical fallacy of, well, we start this, it's going to end up here. Everything in life is a slope. Uh, it's always a bad argument to make. Because we want to have these metaphors because they help us understand God. We just can't go too far with them. So you have to kind of figure out how far on that slope is it safe to walk before you slip and you fall. We'll skip that part. Skip that part. So basically, I kind of said some of that. Basically, does God have eyes and ears? Yes and no. Like a lot of our questions here, it's a yes and no. It's a both and. Does God have physical eyes and ears? Probably not based on the Bible. But does God have eyes and ears, a way to see us, and a way to hear us, and a way to interact with us? Absolutely. That's the truth these metaphors get at. What is the essence, the true reality of God? God is a God who listens and comforts and speaks to us 
and is with us and is for us and is holy and is powerful. And we take all these things we know about God and we try to figure out how do we speak about that using only the things we have experienced. And that's why we have a metaphor. It's an important part of the Bible. But we have to always remember what metaphor is, how far it goes, and how far it doesn't. Questions, comments, snide remarks. All right, I will see you next week.